This meeting of the Board of Chiropractic Examiners is being held by teleconference pursuant to the statutory provisions of Government Code Section 11133. The date is Friday, January 20th, 2023, and the time is 9.01 a.m. The Board's paramount responsibility is to protect the health, welfare, and safety of the public through licensure, education, engagement, and enforcement in chiropractic care. Members of the public may address the board during the public comment session. Public comments will also be taken on agenda items at the time the item is heard and prior to the board taking any action on said items. Those who would like to provide public comment will be limited to three minutes, unless in the discretion of the board, circumstances require a longer period. Members of the public will not be permitted to yield their allotted time to other members of the public to make comments. Individuals may appear before the board to discuss items not on today's agenda. However, the board may not discuss or take action on these items except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. Please be aware that this meeting is being recorded. Please turn off or silence all cell phones. And we will now take roll call. Dr. Adams, would you please take the roll? Uh, should I defer that to Mr. Sweet? Uh, Mr. Sweet is uh, excused. He's going to be uh, he's going to be here in about an hour. Or so um, we're going to, if you don't mind. My apologies. No, happy to do it. Okay, Dr. Paris. Present. Lawrence Adams is present. Mr. Sweet is absent. Excused Ms. until about ten. Excused. Yep. Um, Ms. Cruz. Present. And Dr. Pamela Daniels. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. I'm not informing you in advance of that. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, moving to agenda item number two, public comment for items not on the agenda. Um, again, uh, members of the public may address the committee at this time. Um, Please note that identifying yourselves is voluntary and your name will be recorded in the official minutes of the meeting if it is provided at the time of your comment. Um, and I would like to just say again, uh, this agenda item is for uh, items, public comment for items not on the agenda and members of the public will have an opportunity to comment during um, each agenda item today. So uh, can we please, uh, moderator, can we please open this agenda item for public comment? Certainly, and we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If you would like to make note of an item that is not on the agenda, you can look for the question mark icon, typically at the lower right of your WebEx computer screen, or if you are a call-in user, you can press star three to raise your hand, or anyone may raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon. Each person will have three minutes to speak with a 30 second warning. And for, we have a request for comment from calling user two. I'm gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone and you'll have three minutes. And you can press star six to unmute yourself. There you go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm a student intern from Life Chiropractic College West. My name is Falcon Dumont. I sent in a public comment about uh, a request for the rule change for some of the education requirements about the non, uh, non-adjusting non patient uh, encounter that finds no subluxation and, and no adjustment. Uh, I, I just uh, would like to, when it's time to speak about that part, uh, I also found an item from, um, it was the uh, behavioral health information notice and ICD-10 codes. And they have a code called Z03.89, it's an ICD-10 code. And it actually does, it's a, it's a no diagnosis uh, code that finds for encounter for observation for other suspected diseases and conditions ruled out and it recognizes the beneficiary's assessment phase of their treatment. I couldn't find a chiropractic equivalent of it. And I, I assume that if uh, the education requirement and it is made, the natural tr uh, progression after that would make the ICD-10 equivalent for it. Thank you for your time and I'll uh, speak with you 
when it's uh, when this uh, portion uh, is uh, uh, posted on on today's agenda. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And I do not see any other requests for comment at this time. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Chair Parrish? Yes. I just had a quick question. Would it be possible to have that, that person that just gave the public comment, could they perhaps put that code that they just referenced into the chat box so I could write that down and then ch do a little work, little research on that myself? Sure, and uh, I believe that uh, he has also been in contact with staff, and so I will um, also see if, if staff might reach out to him if he's not um, hearing us right now, but I also heard him mention that he uh, planned on commenting during um, yeah. the appropriate agenda item, so we, surely we can um, get it then too. Okay, yeah. excellent, thank you. And this, this is the moderator. We have not enabled the chat feature at this point, but scrolling back in the record, it looks like there's a code that is numbered 03.8910. At least that's what the smart captioning provided. But we do not have the ability to open a chat. Thank you. That's fine. And, and, and if, if we need to, we'll, we'll get it clarified later. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay. Um, Moving to uh, board chair's report. Um, well, I'm going to start out um, just most recently. I was um, at Palmer College of Chiropractic West on Wednesday, January 11th, and spoke to the uh, General Assembly um, and also just generally about chiropractic and, and its place in healthcare and um, the opportunities that they might have as students. But then more focused, um, we did a presentation to two sessions uh, for the uh, students there, and it was on pathway to licensure and avoiding potential pitfalls during licensure. And um, it was well received. We, we had a, a, a lot of questions, and I hope it's something that, um, you know, any, all of us, uh, if we're given the opportunity, we continue to do um, into the future at the um, chiropractic colleges. Um, I really want to recognize, you know, this has been a very busy year. Um, I realize that, and we, I think a year ago, um, or about this time, we, we really, um, we all committed to the hard work and the dedication and the time that it takes, uh, the commitment that it takes for all of us to, to help move these forward. Um, we, we added uh, a committee, which, you know, means, you know, more committee assignments and, and more meetings. And so I just really want to recognize the hard work of, of um, the board staff and, and all the board members and all four committees. Um, you know, in December, I think all of them met just in that month. And, um, and you know, we've made tremendous progress on the, the, uh, the regulatory proposals and uh, process improvements et cetera, and I think we've done a really great job of um, engaging our stakeholders and, and really trying to take that feedback and have meaningful discussions and take meaningful action based on that. Um, and I, I think the, the duty of public protection has been well served um, through all of this. So uh, the, the other good news is there's more to come. Uh, I noticed, you know, we have 19 potentially proposed regula regulations, regulatory proposals uh, in today's uh, packet, and uh, and so I'm looking forward to it all, and I hope you all too, you all are too, and I just want to thank you to each and every one of you, board and staff, and to the public for um, participating with us. It's meaningful. Um, we we desire it and we need it, and uh, so thank you all. Um, the other the other issue is I will say there there will be another we are going to do a one hour CE ethics at uh, for the state association Cal Cairo at their legislative um, at their ledge day. Um, I don't have the date off the top of my head, but I will make sure that gets out to everybody. And um, you know, just there's other opportunities for to engage outside of. Um, just the kind of the state, but the FCLB 
sends us some opportunities to engage with other chiropractic licensing boards. And we've done that in the past. And I, I feel like it's been tremendously fruitful and helpful. Um, it's nice to meet with other regulators and, uh, and there's some shared synergy and that goes on there. And so I'm hoping that we can share those opportunities with the other board members. And if you're, if you're interested with, you know, uh, participating in any of those, um, please let us know. We'd love to have you do that. And finally, uh, we started the strategic plan process uh, seemingly so long ago. And um, I just want to thank uh, Anne and staff and the board members. Uh, we and uh, I think in the executive officer's report, she'll she'll go over the kind of the whole detail of the process. And uh, I think you'll know how many you know how thoughtful that process has been. And I think it's I think the action plan really reflects. Um, something that's going to make uh, you know the board and serving our mission uh, an improved place and um, I'm just really happy with it and uh, so I want to thank you all for that um, and uh, that's all I have if there's any questions I'd be happy to field those hearing none moderator can we please uh, open for public comment Certainly, and we're opening up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone has a comment on the report from the uh, board chair, you can look for the question mark icon, typically in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen, or behind the three dot other options if you're on a mobile device. And anyone may raise their hand to request to speak. Call-in users can use star three to raise their hand. And I do not see any requests for comment. Uh, oh, one moment, I misspoke. Uh, call in user two. I'm gonna send you a request to unmute your microphone and you can use star six to unmute yourself. There you are. You yeah, are. The, um, uh, this, this is talking to Mom again. It, 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 uh, it was a, a Z. Uh, um, Z0, I'm sorry, uh, Z03.89 was the ICD-10 code. That's all. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. And I do not see any other requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. And okay, uh, moving to agenda item number four. Um, election of board officers for 2023. And uh, I'm gonna ask that we uh, defer this item until Mr. Sweet joins us. And um, we have our full, full board slate here for the voting. Um, and I, I'm not sure if I need a motion to do that, uh, Ms. Knight. Uh, no, this is Sabina. We can always take items out of order, and so we can keep moving along until Mr. Sweet arrives. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, do I do I need to take public comment, or can we come back to that for this item? No, we'll take public comment during the motions and the seconds and everything like that okay. for the election. So we'll take care of that all when we come back. And you're running that, correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving to agenda item number five. Uh, review and possible approval of October 26, 27, 2022 board meeting minutes. Um, I realized that um, there were some uh, edits to the board members. Uh, the packet was um, updated a little bit later than usual for um, our purposes, and uh, so if if anyone didn't feel like they had um, enough time to fully review these and discuss or make a motion, um, I would I would entertain uh, the idea that we uh, defer approval of the minutes until the April meeting, if needed.
Okay. Um, not hearing the need for that. Is there any discussion? No discussion of the meeting minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve the draft minutes of the October 26, 27, 2022 meeting? I'll motion to approve the minutes of the October 26, 27 board meeting. Thank you. I'll second. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion from the board members? Hearing none, um, moderator, would you please open this agenda item for public comment? Certainly, and if anyone has any public comment about the meeting minutes, you can look for the question mark icon, type the word comment in the text box and click send, or you may raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and call in users, can you star three to raise their hand? And I see no requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Dr. Adams, uh, in Dr. Sweet's absence, would you please call the roll for the vote on this motion? I will. Uh, Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Sweet is absent. Ms. Cruz? Yes. And Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Moving to agenda item number six. Review and possible ratification of approved doctor of chiropractic license applications. Is there a is there a motion to approve to ratify? I should say. I motion I'll to make, approve. Oh. I motion to approve and ratify uh, the applications. I'll second that. Dr. Adams. Thank you. Is there any discussion? from the board members. Hearing none, moderator, would you please open this agenda item for public comment? Certainly, and if anyone has any comment on the ratification of approved doctor of chiropr chiropractic license applications, you can look for the question mark icon, type the word comment in that text box and click send, or you may click on the hand icon to raise your hand and calling users can use star three to raise their hand. And I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the Q&A feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Adams, would you again, please call the roll for the vote? I will. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Sweet? Absent. Ms. Cruz? Yes. And Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving to agenda item number seven. Review and possible ratification of approved continuing education provider applications. And is there any discussion from the board members? Yeah, I had a question on the Andrew Osborne. I didn't see, it wasn't marked if it was a new or a biennial renewal application.
do we know or does it matter? I think it matters. It's um it's it's a new application. The biennial renewal applications are processed by staff and don't require board approval. This would be an application for a new provider. Thank you. And I have uh, two things um, for yeah the Andrew Osborne one. I just noticed there was a, a typo within his. Um, application where his name is listed two different ways. So just want to make sure whatever we have on file is the correct version. And then also, is it normal for in the second column, the CE oversight contact person for there to be multiple people? I just wasn't sure if that was kind of a normal practice. So for Christopher John, the contact person is a uh, uh, Christopher and Nadine. So wasn't sure if that was normal practice. Um, and I would like to defer to uh, Dixie Van Allen if you're able to answer that question. Um, it can be normal to have more than one person. I know for that particular person, he's been a provider in the past and Nadine is the primary um, contact person for him, but um, they're both able to handle matters for that providership. Good. Trustee Joy, thank you. Motion to approve uh, continuing education provider, provider applications. A second. Ms. Cruz, second. Any further discussion from the board? I would just um, just like to clarify that 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 um, we would address the the typo and the spelling. Miss Cruz mentioned in in the provider applications. Correct. Yeah, we'll we'll make the necessary corrections to our internal records, and we will have the correct spelling of Andrew Osborne's name uh, yeah. in our internal records. Yes. Okay. Um, hearing no further discussion, moderator, can we please open this agenda item for public comment? Certainly. And we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone would like to comment on the continuing education provider applications, you may look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen or behind the three dot other options if you're on a mobile device type the word comment into the text box and click send. The other option is to raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon and our calling users can press star three to raise their hand. And I see no requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Dr. Adams, would you please call the roll for the vote? Yes. Dr. Paris? Yes. Dr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Sweet is absent. Ms. Cruz? Yes. Dr. Daniels? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving to agenda item number eight. Um, we are going to receive an update on the Department of Consumer Affairs from Judy Bucciarelli from the DCA Office of Board and Bureau Relations. And uh, I will turn it over to Ms. Bucciarelli. I hope I got that right. And this is the moderator, Ms. Bucciarelli. You are unmuted, but we're not hearing your voice. We're showing some troubleshooting options on the screen.
Uh, this is Sabina. Oh, sorry, Anne. Go ahead. I was just going to make note that Judy's gone on mute again. I, I was going to suggest perhaps someone to get her um, report and could possibly read it at later in the meeting so we don't hold everything up. We could continue a little bit with the executive officer's report while we wait for her to um, you know, tackle those technology issues. Um, and then we will have, uh, we can always circle back to her or we can uh, move with the um, presentation from the DAG if the DAG is present. And as a point of information, the DAG has not yet logged in. Let's, um, if it if it's okay with everyone, um, thank you for that suggestion, Ms. Knight. Let's let's move to um, agenda item ten. And Ms. Walker, if if you're ready for the executive office report, we'll go ahead with that, and um, and then we'll circle back um, to agenda item number eight and Ms. Bucciarelli's update. Sure, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so this morning, um, I'm primarily going to be providing an update on our um, our pending regulations. As you see in the written report that was contained in the meeting materials, um, as we approach the end of 2022 and into early this year, um, we worked on our rulemaking calendar for 2023, and we um, we sat down and put in the time to to cleanly separate out our different regulatory proposals um, so that we can then um, set targets for which quarter of the year we're gonna plan on um, addressing those. So within the meeting materials, that's where under proposed regulations, you now see the 19 separate proposals that we do have pending. Um, I'm very proud of staff for um, putting the effort in to uh, separate separate each of these proposals out as it, it does uh, neatly organize our work so that we can plan for 2023. Um, of note, there are the addition of some new uh, proposals on that list that hadn't been previously um, presented to the board. Uh, the first of which is a section 100 change to simply um, update the fee amounts on our forms. That's a more, that's a more cleanup effort that'll be done by staff and filed with the Office of Administrative Law. Um, no specific action is needed by the board, but it's necessary for us to ensure that our forms that are um, on our website and that are in regulation are are the appropriate versions with the correct fee amounts and they're appropriately numbered. So that that's um, number one in the meeting materials. We're also going to be working on a proposal to formally um, use um, add the licensee telephone numbers and email addresses to the board's directory. Um, this is a provision that was included in the board's sunset bill but we don't have a regulation that specifically requires the filing of an email address or a telephone number. Um, so staff is working on that proposal and we plan to present that to the licensing committee for review and discussion at their next meeting. Another section 100 change that um, has been added to the list is the repeal of the sponsored free healthcare events regulations. Um, that's another one that has that's being um, repealed by staff based on the fact that our underlying statutory authority to um, to have those regulations was repealed by law in law. So we now need to do a cleanup where we formally take those regulations out um, of um, off the board's regulations. Then we're also continuing with um, the other workload that we've that we've had. And then we've separated out the CPEI proposals into um, into separate proposals. And you'll see that when it comes to the filing of addresses, that is being um, directed to the licensing committee rather than the enforcement committee to ensure that we have some balance there and that we can adequately move the different packages forward without um, overly burdening um, the enforcement committee. Um, another, uh, the other major item that we've been working on um, since the last board meeting has been continuing on the Connect project. We've been uh, we've been continuing to work on enhancing the user experience, and we've done quite a bit of work on documenting our requirements for the continuing education functionality. Um, what we're expecting is for the enhancements to the user system. We're current; it's tied to the completion of the vendor's work on the cashiering functionality. So our current timeline that we've been given is um, a release date around mid-February of this year. As far as the continuing education functionality. Um, we plan to begin the development of that in February, and then through phased releases through 2023, we'll begin adding that functionality to the system. We're planning to leverage some of the functionality that's already in place um, with the Board of Accountancy and the Acupuncture Board for efficiency and to ensure that we can, we can roll out a product rather quickly. 
Um, the strategic plan will be addressed um, under agenda item 11. And then the, only, the other items I wanted to highlight within my report, um, you'll see there's some, been some changes to the licensing program statistics. We're trying to, um, to use uh, the data that we have available in our various systems to be able to provide um, more meaningful reports to the board when it comes to our licensing statistics. Um, in prior reports, it was simply um, just a matter of volume within a given time frame and reporting on months. But we do want to, um, so what we've done there, we presented to the enforcement or the licensing committee in December, and we want to build on it, is um, breaking it down by population, um, measuring, you know, the years that someone's been licensed, um, measuring um, the geographic area where we have licensees in the state. And then also where we're gonna build on this is to um, begin reporting timeframes. So rather than just capturing um, numbers and volume, we also wanna incorporate processing times for each of these application types into future reports. So that's that's where we're going. We're gonna share that initially with the licensing committee and then bring it forward to the board. We wanna take a similar effort with the enforcement statistics um, we've been using the same tables for quite a few years, and that's that's what's contained in the meeting packet itself. Um, as far as our our numbers, they look good. We're pretty consistent with where we've been over the over the past year. Um, we do want to expand upon these statistics for future reports and incorporate the same thought that we're putting in with the licensing statistics, where we're not only reporting simply volumes to the board, but also reporting timeframes associated, and also ensuring that we're capturing um, the full uh, the full um, workload that's being completed by staff. One of the one of the challenges with the existing tables that you see is um, we have broken down closed complaints into a very narrow category. So you're not seeing a very high volume there, but there's also complaints closed with other closure types that aren't currently reported forward in this report. So we wanna clean that up a bit and um, start reporting the full amount of closures and then provide a more detailed breakdown as, and also timeframes. So we'll work on developing that um, through this winter and present it first to the enforcement committee and then eventually to the board. Is there anything specific? Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the operations of the board or anything contained within my report. Ms. Walker, I was just, can I get a little more background with the uh, item, the proposed regulation number three on the repeal for the sponsored fee healthcare? Sure. Um, so there was, there was legislation that, um, that mandated that the boards um, basically allow for licensees from other states to come into California for if they're providing um, a sponsored free healthcare event. And then the board subsequently based on that legislation had adopted um, an entire article of regulations sur um, basically surrounding that effort. Well, the underlying legislation that, that was based on was repealed effective January 1st of 2018. So those regulations no longer have any effect because we were missing the underlying statutory authority for those regulations. So the purpose there is simply a cleanup for us to remove the regulations now that that statutory authority is no longer there. Okay, great. And then are we uh, concerned or with people coming from out of state providing uh, you know, the, the free healthcare events as far as safety for the public? Well, they're, they're no longer permitted to do that because there's there's no longer the statutory authority that allowed it. So it's it's a matter of cleanup. And then also on the light, as far as the licensing committee, um, there's efforts there to study reciprocity. Um, and then there's also um, le new legislation to grant temporary licensure to military spouses coming into California who are licensed in another state. So we're gonna be addressing addressing it through that those mechanisms, but the sponsored free healthcare will no longer be in our regulations. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. I have um, just a question and a comment. Um, so when we look at uh, breaking down the, the categories a little bit more, I think, I think it might be um, it might be helpful to expand on the probationary periods because I think it gives us a sense of, you know, whether it's a five year or three year and how many are getting um, 
you know, kind of those levels. I think that might be a little bit helpful into the future, um, just as one suggestion. And then on agenda item, uh, I'm sorry, attachment 4B um, in the in the chart and the graph. And I will say these are a big improvement over what we were doing just a few years ago. So I think there's some um, the natural progress here is really nice. I think this just kind of keeps getting better. Um, there's clearly some quality improvement process going on. So thank you. Um, it's the 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 major category is non jurisdictional and uh, at 39. Can you can you give us a little detail on that? Um, sure. So we've we've observed um, since we launched the new online complaint form, we've had an increase in non jurisdictional complaints. Um, primarily, those are driven by um, what happens is when people are googling um, a chiropractic board in other states, they're finding our online complaint form and they're filing their complaints against out of state chiropractors um, with the incorrect board. So we're directing them to the proper resource, and that complaint is close as non jurisdictional, as as we can't take any action on it. And we're also we also um, also within that category are um, complaints that we receive primarily um, due to just uh, monetary disputes with a chiropractor, and that's something that's also not within our jurisdiction, like the fee amount that's charged for the visit, things to that effect. Not um, unprofessional conduct, but purely you know this this licensee charges a higher fee than um, what I'm used to paying, which is not within our jurisdiction. So that's what falls under that category. What's generally the direction we would give the public in those cases? Um, so we we generally will uh, refer them to um, the Department of Consumer Affairs um, Small Claims Court Guide if they if there's a dispute over um, you know an agreement that they had for um, compensation for certain care. Um, we also uh, just educate them on um, just the the board's jurisdictional limits and the fact that we that we don't we don't set fee amounts and it's not something that we regulate so unfortunately we can't we can't help them in those circumstances uh, thank you that's helpful and then uh one other thing when we look at the unlicensed on the same attachment 4b when we look at unlicensed practice um in at the second highest category of complaints um <laughs> is that, are those mainly due to ce audits where we would consider them unlicensed because they haven't done their continued education? Um, they're not due to CE audits, but what they're primarily primarily driven by is um, licensees when, when their license has lapsed, um, if they fail to renew and it goes into forfeiture status and they file their application to restore the license, one of the questions on the application is, um, at any time have you practiced while your license was expired? And they'll answer yes. And then it becomes an enforcement case based with a a uh, summary type of unlicensed practice. So the majority of the complaints within that category are licensees who continued practicing while their license had lapsed. There's a very small percentage of complaints within that category that are truly unlicensed individuals who are suspected of practicing chiropractic without a license. Um, understood. Thank you for that. I have no other um, questions. Are there, are there any other questions from the board? I just have a comment uh, in reviewing for today's meeting. I just want to commend uh, you, Ms. Walker, um, what the what the, you and the staff, I think, has accomplished in the last year and, and the direction and the and the work that you've done in, in, in moving CE and enforcement and licensure and all these stuff forward. and. All the stuff that we've accomplished in the last year that Dr. Um, Paris referred to or in his report is, in my opinion, just amazing, um, you know, light speed. So I just wanted to give you kudos. And I'm looking over something and all the stuff that we're discussing today that's really been kind of coming on for the last year. It's uh, it's and, and looking back over previous meetings um, in the past, a lot's been accomplished. So kudos to you and to the staff. And uh, and I just. I'm I'm excited and thrilled for um, you hit the you hit the ground running just like we thought you would when uh, we elevated you to this position and and you've you've uh, you proved us right which is great so thank you thank you and the staff thank you if there are no further questions or discussion by the board and. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Adams. I would echo your sentiments too. Thank you for saying that. Um, 
hearing no further discussion, uh, I'd ask the moderator to open this agenda item for public comment. Certainly, we're opening up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone has any comment, they can look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of their WebEx screen, type the word comment in the text box and click send, or they are welcome to raise their hand by pressing the hand icon. And if you are a call-in user, you may press star three to raise your hand. And I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. And uh, unless there, that this was uh, informational, so no vote needed. And unless there is an objection, I would like to move, uh, go out of order to agenda item number nine. That is the presentation on legal process for disciplinary actions by the Office of the Eternal Attorney General Licensing Section. And we'd like to welcome Deputy Attorney General Lisa Miller. She is our board's liaison uh, from the Attorney General's Office. Uh, Ms. Miller, I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Parrish, members of the board, Ms. Walker, and all the staff. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to my hopefully brief presentation about the function of the Attorney General's Office in conjunction with the Chiropractic Board. So uh, I just wanted to kind of give a little brief explanation about myself so that you know who I am. I am a Deputy Attorney General, as uh, Dr. Parrish said, and I have been with the Attorney General's Office for five years now. Um, I am a Deputy Attorney General for um, recently promoted, yay. Um, and prior to that, I, uh, working at the Attorney General's Office, I worked at the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, doing a very similar job to what I do now, which is prosecuting misconduct. Um, there I had a slightly more investigative role uh, in investigating misconduct, and prior to that, I was in private practice. So I'm very happy to be at the Attorney General's Office, and I'm very proud to serve as the liaison of the Attorney General's Office to the Chiropractic Board. Um, so what that means is the liaison is that I function as a, a conduit um, for information between the AG's office and the board. So if on one hand, if uh, members of the board, excuse me, if, if board staff have questions about uh, cases, sufficiency of evidence, that kind of thing, I am happy to answer any questions that they have. Sometimes I can facilitate getting documents from uh, law enforcement offices, um, they're very responsive oftentimes to AG requests for arrest reports and things of that nature. So I'm happy to help with that. And then on the other side of things, um, in my office, if there are DAGs, deputies, uh, attorney general who have questions about proceeding with a case such as the pleading or relevant statutes, I can answer any questions they have. Um, I don't often get involved in cases that have already been assigned to other deputies in my office. Um, I'm just there to answer questions and facilitate communication between the board and the AG. Um, and overseeing all of this act, um, activity is my SDAG, who is my, my uh, supervising uh, deputy attorney general, who is my boss, and then over all of the supervising deputies and deputies is our SAG, um, our senior assistant, and that is Carl Sani. And he does an admirable job in the role, and he basically oversees the operation of all of the licensing section um, in all of the state offices. And we do have offices in Sacramento, Los Angeles, San Diego, Oakland, and San Francisco, excuse me, San Francisco. So quite a few offices around the state with a number of deputies who are representing a lot of different agencies. Um, in addition to the chiropractic board, we also represent the Board of Registered Nursing, Veterinary Board, Dental Board, um, Commission on Teacher Credentialing, and a lot of other agencies as well. Um, I would say that our two biggest clients, uh, just by case volume, are the Board of Registered Nursing and the Bureau of Automotive Repair. But that doesn't mean that our um, smaller volume clients, such as the chiropractic board, are any less important. We value all of our clients equally. and are proud to represent all of the agencies um, in administrative proceedings and superior court as needed. 
So um, I would like to just kind of go through, I prepared a slideshow presentation just to talk about um, the, the role of the AG's office and what it is that we do um, in our work for the, uh, the chiropractic board. And so if I could um, ask for the next slide, please. Okay, so as the members of the board are probably familiar, but for everyone else, um, the powers of the board are numerous, um, including granting licensure, investigating allegations of unprofessional conduct, which is what I heard Ms. Walker talking about earlier on, uh, disciplining licenses for unprofessional conduct, providing guidance in education and training, and then providing the public with information re relating to chiropractic, and then preventing unlicensed individuals from practicing chiropractic, which all of which are very important. And next slide, please. Okay, so as with most licensing agencies that the Attorney General's Office represents, um, the kind of overarching goal of each agency is really to protect the public. Um, and that's set forth in the Chiropractic Act of 1922. Um, there are several sections within that act that describe the importance of public protection. So that's something that we always strive um, to ensure. Thank you, next slide, please. Okay, so um, as, you, as the board members are all probably familiar, um, there are a number of activities that the board engages in that are not, uh, that the AG's office does not participate in, such as administering the board, rulemaking, standards of care and professionalism, uh, licensure requirements, continuing education, probation monitoring and funding. So all of those activities go on with really no participation by the Attorney General's office. Um, so that's a tremendous amount of work that you all do and we are appreciative. Next slide, please. Okay, and now um, as to where the Attorney General's office fits in. So we work closely with the enforcement unit to really ensure that the rules and regulations adopted by the board are enforced. So for the most part, that means filing and prosecuting accusations. That's the bulk of what we do for the chiropractic board. Um, and how that transpires is that a case will be transmitted to one of our offices um, with an investigation file, uh, such as a report and an expert report and other documents that support that investigation. And so once we receive all that information, we review it, make sure that there is sufficient evidence to proceed. And then we generate uh, an accusation setting forth what we believe are the relevant causes for discipline for that chiropractor. Um, we also file and prosecute pro probation revocation hearings. I do not believe I've done one of those yet for the chiropractic board, but that is something we do a lot for other boards. Um, and that is something that we can also do for the chiro board. We also file statements of issues. And what those are is when an applicant um, for the chiropractic license um, submits their application and there are reasons that are concerning to the board that they might not want to issue a license, such as oftentimes it's a criminal conviction or multiple criminal convictions. Um, that's something where the board will deny the license and then the applicant has the option to appeal that denial and then we proceed to hearing um, on that basis. We also can handle um, contested citation hearings. So if the board chooses to issue a citation to a chiropractor for less egregious conduct, um, but the, uh, the licensee then contests that citation, then that's something that we can do as well. Um, I would say oftentimes the EG's office does a lot of those for the contractor's board. Um, that's I think where we see that come up the most. Um, in addition, we can also appear and represent the board at uh, petitions for reinstatement and penalty modification. So um, that doesn't come up quite as often, but that is something that we can do. And lastly, we can also appear on behalf of the board um, in criminal court pursuant to penal code section 23, which is a interesting section that basically allows a licensing agency such as the chiropractic board to um, intervene almost in a criminal proceeding and ask for a temporary restriction of licensure um, because of criminal conduct that is somehow related to the practice of chiropractic or we think that that chiropractor could be a danger to the public. Um, I have handled those, one of those on behalf of the board before. Um, it comes up um, and 
I'll be talking a little bit more about that later, but basically that's something that we can only do at a certain period in the criminal case. We can't just appear at any time and ask for a licensure restriction. It has to be basically after there's some evidence, such as after a preliminary hearing where the prosecutor puts on some evidence as to indicate probable cause for of the licensee's guilt. So that's something we do as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Something I want to also mention, and I apologize for blazing through a lot of information here, but hopefully this shines some light on what it is that we do. The burden of proof, and what that is, is basically the level up to which we have to prove allegations in an administrative proceeding on behalf of the board. And it is actually different from regular civil court. So if there's a civil lawsuit over an injury, or if there's a contract violation or a dispute, it's a different burden of proof than that. And it's also different from criminal courts, where of course the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. So in our, excuse me, in our administrative proceedings, it is for chiropractors because there is a high level of skill and education that goes into obtaining licensure. It is clear and convincing evidence that is required. And so what does that actually mean? That means that it has to be very certain. It's not very well defined in the case law, but it basically means that it's somewhere between probable cause, which is more likely than not that the licensee has committed the misconduct, and somewhere between that and reasonable, beyond a reasonable doubt. So where that falls exactly kind of depends on the judge who is handling the case on behalf of the board. But it basically means that we have to prove pretty convincingly that, very convincingly, that the licensee has done the misconduct that is alleged. So that's kind of what that is. And that's set forth in the government, the government code, which is part of the Administrative Procedure Act. So there are some judges who, when we take cases to hearing, they act like we basically have to prove things beyond a reasonable doubt, and they won't accept anything less than they are absolutely certain that there is no chance that the, you know, licensee could be falsely accused of the allegations. So we have to be very diligent about presenting our cases, making sure we have the evidence to support our causes for discipline when we go to hearing. They're not quite the same as maybe the criminal cases you see on TV, where there's a jury and the public, you know, all watching with bated breath. Our cases are a little bit more informal to a certain degree. We do have an administrative law judge. We also have a court reporter, but we don't have any jury. There's, you know, oftentimes no members of the public present watching. So it is somewhat less formal than that. All of the rules of evidence still apply. So we are still making objections, laying foundation for evidence, having witnesses testify. So that's kind of how that works. Next slide, please. Okay. So there are a number of statutory and regulatory grounds for discipline within the world of chiropractic. Overarching everything is the Chiropractic Initiative Act of 1922, which has also been codified in West Civil Codes. And the Chiropractic Act basically permits us to seek discipline on behalf of the board for violation. There's a kind of a catch-all for violation of any rules and regulations adopted by the board. And then also for there are certain offenses that are enumerated, such as fraud and obtaining a license, that kind of thing. But typically we use, excuse me, the California Code of Regulations. There are a number of sections within the regulations that allow us to seek specific discipline for specific causes of action, such as false advertising. The ones, this isn't exhaustive, but the ones we see the most are unprofessional conduct, which includes gross negligence, incompetence, if it's repeat negligence, substantially related crimes, that kind of thing. And then there's also different and separate sections for things like failure to maintain patient records, failure to maintain accountability billings, and failure to obtain informed consent. So these are kind of the big ones we see a lot or that I have seen a lot in handling chiropractic cases. But these provide the basis for us to take action in before the Office of Administrative Hearings. Next slide, please. 
Okay. And something else I wanted to mention is um, the situations, the unfortunate situations, which are often very sad, in which a chiropractor um, has perhaps demonstrated some sort of mental impairment. Typically, it's mental impairment, not so much physical impairment. Um, and when this comes into play, uh, we file a pleading that's different from an accusation. Um, it is basically what's called an 820 petition. And there's also a parallel section within the uh, Code of Regulations for chiropractic, which um, ha has the very similar language. So we file these for all different licensing agencies. We see it the most in the, the, uh, the healing arts cases. For, so for any health professional that's um, demonstrating some kind of mental instability, perhaps they've, they've done something very concerning where we're worried about the public. Um, this enables us to take quick action to protect the public. So what our office does um, in these cases is we file a petition alleging that we, so these are uh, more confidential proceedings. So when we do accusations, statements of issues, those are public documents. Our petitions under the Business and Profession Code 820 or uh, Code of Regulations 315, these are confidential. So because they contain a lot of mm, oftentimes information that's I think would be potentially highly embarrassing to the licensee that may not, it may be due to mental illness. So we'll set forth the circumstances uh, that are concerning that lead us to think that there is a danger to public, um, danger to the public. Um, and then we will basically require, uh, when this is filed, we will require the licensee to obtain a psychiatric evaluation within a very short period of time. I believe it's a month. Um, they have to seek an examination with a person who is a, a approved by the board um, to examine and conduct a mental evaluation. And then that examiner will then determine if the person is safe to practice. Um, all the cases I have handled on behalf of other boards, um, it usually sadly results in a situation where the person is deemed unsafe to practice. And then in that situation, we would then file an accusation um, based on the finding of unfitness to practice. So this is a, it's a very short timeline to conduct all these different steps, but it basically enables the board um, through the attorney general's office to quickly make sure that a person is safe to practice. And if they're not to restrict them from practice for public safety. Um, <clears throat> something, some things that I wanted to mention about these, this, this process is if a licensee refuses to be examined, then that is a basis also for filing an exam, um, for also filing an accusation. So if we file the 820 peti petition or uh, CCR 315 petition and the licensee just refuses, they won't uh, obtain an, an examination by a um, approved examiner, then we would just file an accusation based on the failure to comply. And then so the outcome would be the same is if they were deemed unfit, they would be prevented from practice on that basis. So um, in addition, if a licensee, perhaps if they are suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, um, that's something we would be wanting to take action on behalf of the board for, because if they were just to retire, you know, if presumably if they had a you know, moments of lucidity and they wanted to reactivate their license, that is something that they could do which would further endanger the public. So we wanna make sure that they are, the license uh, ability to practice is removed. So um, yeah. And in cases where we do find a licensee is uh, unsafe to practice, perhaps they have gone through uh, an examination and the examiner says, yeah, I, I don't think they're safe. Um, as I mentioned, we file an accusation and then we go to a hearing before an administrative law judge where we basically present the report, finding them unsafe to practice. Um, and in that situation, the administrative law judge would, would then um, issue a decision um, revoking the license. So that's how that would proceed. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so we have licensees for not just the chiropractic board, but a lot of other boards where you know, people have demonstrated um, perhaps not psychiatric impairments, but they are engaging in very uh, concerning and questionable conduct. Perhaps they have um, 
sexually assaulted someone or they've done some something else that maybe um you know the the, the criminal justice system is not necessarily uh taking a, a, a role there and so we we need to make sure that the public is is safe and we need to stop uh practices as soon as possible so this is a different option an alternative basically under the business and professions code uh, 494 we can seek what's called an interim suspension order and this is kind of a unique and interesting um, option i've done this for multiple other boards which is basically where we um we draft what's we refer to it as an iso so we draft the iso petition um, we don't actually produce any evidence when we take this to hearing on the ISO. We just have declarations. Uh, we don't produce any live evidence, excuse me. So we basically have declarations. Um, that's typically how it's done, although I have seen arrest reports um, used as well that perhaps did not result in a conviction. So we prepare the ISO petition, we go to a hearing, and um, the judge will review the declarations, the petition, and they will decide in very short order if they believe that there is grounds to grant uh, a suspension order. And what that does, that prevents the licensee from practicing um, immediately. So that is a quick, quick fix. The caveat with that is that we, that triggers a very abbreviated timeline for the next steps. So if an um, ISO order is issued, uh, we have to immediately draft an accusation um, proving up the conduct that we described in declarations or presenting witnesses as needed. And that, that accusation hearing must be held in very short order. So the accusation has to be drafted 30 days there after the um, suspension order is issued. Then we have to have the hearing on the accusation immediately thereafter. So that's something that we have to really have our ducks in a row and be ready to proceed immediately with. So it's a very short timeline. So it's not something we do a great deal because um, it's just, it's difficult. And sometimes we have to worry about if there is also a pending criminal case that we don't want to in interfere with. Because if we basically put on witnesses uh, and that there is a pending criminal case, that could potentially interfere with law enforcement's investigation. So this isn't something we, we enter, you know, enter into lightly, but it is an option for cases where we need to take quick action on uh, on behalf of the board to protect the public. So, um, yeah, that's what what an ISO is. And next slide, please. Okay. And this is something I touched on earlier. Um, so, you know, in cases where um, a licensee has basically been charged with a crime, this is something where we can utilize the penal code section I mentioned earlier, 23, um, and we can basically intervene in the criminal case. Like I said, that there's a, a kind of a short window to do that. Um, and then we can ask the superior court judge in the criminal case to basically restrict the license for the pendency of the criminal case. Um, so for example, um, I'll talk about one that's not from the chiropractic board, but I did one for the dental board where a, uh, a dentist was accused of, of strangling his mother for financial gain. And I was worried, and as was the board, the dental board, that that dentist might be able to post bail and thus be able to continue practice, um, which he presumably needed to do to finance his, his criminal defense. So... I appeared on behalf of the dental board to request a restriction in case he bailed out. Ultimately, the judge did deny bail in that case. So the, um, the penal code 23 uh, motion was rendered unnecessary, but a lot of times we can get a restriction for the pendency of the criminal case, just in case the person is released on own recognizance or they bail out. And that way we can protect the public while the case is ongoing. Um, as I mentioned, there is a short window. So, um, for when a criminal case is filed, um, the defendant is arraigned. And then after they are arraigned, um, if it is a felony, that there, there is what's called a preliminary hearing. And at the preliminary hearing, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, the prosecutor will put on a small bit of evidence, um, just enough to show the, uh, the judge that there is probable cause that the defendant committed the crime. That, according to case law, there has uh, been several recent decisions. Um, there's the Gray case and the Naidu case. 
that basically say that a board, such as the chiropractic board, cannot seek a Penal Code 23 restriction without any evidence. We can't just go in an arraignment and say, Your Honor, this person is a danger. Restrict this person's license now. Most of the time, the judge will say, No, there's no proof, no evidence. I'm denying the request. It has worked occasionally, but that's typically when we have a criminal court judge who doesn't perhaps know the ins and the outs of the law in this kind of unique area. So we are often not successful if we go in before the preliminary hearing. If we go in at the preliminary hearing, just after the prosecutor has finished and the defendant has been held to answer, then we can say, Your Honor, there has been evidence presented by the prosecutor indicating that the defendant did commit the crimes, which are substantially related to the practice of chiropractic. Can you please restrict the defendant's license for the rest of the case? And that's when we are oftentimes very successful in getting a restriction at that time. After the preliminary hearing is also difficult because then there has to be a change in circumstances under the law. And unless we can prove that there is some sort of new information that no one had before, we are really not able to get a licensure restriction in criminal court after the preliminary hearing. It has to be done really kind of at that time. So like I said, a very small window of time, but that's something that we can do to make sure that the defendant is not practicing and not endangering the public. Next slide, please. Okay. All right. So another area where we can assist is something that I've been asked before is about if there are concerns with granting a license to a new applicant. And basically there are, you know, as the board members are probably familiar with, they can just issue the license if there are, you know, maybe the concerns aren't that great. Or they can issue subject to terms and conditions. And this is set forth in California Code of Regulations, Section 325. So basically a probationary license where the chiropractor is given a license, but they have, they're basically on probation for three years or five years or what have you and have to comply with other conditions. Or the board can just outright deny the license. And that happens. But something that has changed is in recent, in the past few years, there have been changes thanks to Assembly Bill 2138 and corresponding Business and Professions Code Section 480, where it really limits the board's ability to deny licensure if a person has had their convictions expunged. So that means, you know, for example, like for other boards, if we have a nurse who's applying for licensure and they were convicted of shoplifting, but they had it expunged, then perhaps, you know, in that situation, the board would not be able to, the nursing board would not be able to deny a license based on that shoplifting conviction. If that is the sole basis for denial is that expunged conviction. So that is something that is, has changed recently. And that is something we have to look out for on whether or not we can use expunged convictions if that's the sole basis for denial is that conviction. So next slide, please. Okay. Now, in situations where the board, the executive section, executive unit of the, or excuse me, not executive, the enforcement unit of the board has received reports of misconduct, something that they, and they have determined that discipline of some kind is in order. There are a number of things that the board can do. First and foremost is a citation and fine under California Code of Regulations, Section 390. And this isn't something that we typically see at the Attorney General's Office for the Chiropractic Board, because oftentimes if the licensee has issued a fine and a citation, I would, you know, my understanding is that they frequently comply with that citation and fine if there's an order of abatement, that kind of thing. And the Attorney General's Office would never see that unless it is contested for some reason, which I have not seen. Another option the board has is to issue a letter of admonishment under Regulation Section 389. I have not seen one of those personally before. I believe it is similar to other boards will issue with what they call a letter of public approval. So I feel like that's the same thing, but that is an option for not egregious incidents of misconduct. 
And then something that my office does deal with quite a bit is when the board wishes to revoke and stay. So that's something where it would be transmitted to my office to uh, draft an accusation and handle that that case. And that's where um, you know the board is quite concerned about the the misconduct, and they wish to revoke the person's the licensee's license or perhaps stay it um, with with conditions. Um, and all of these are set forth in the, the board's disciplinary guidelines. And as the board members are probably familiar with, um, a suspension can be part of the uh, conditions accompanying the state revocation. But again, that is something um, that that is to ensure public safety. It's not just punitive. Um, sometimes, uh, not the chiropractic board, but other boards, um, you know, their initial reaction will be to ask for a suspension, but unless that's necessary to protect the public in some way, such as the licensee needs to, to pass an exam to demonstrate their competence, um, a suspension would not be advisable in that situation because it would just be punitive. I mean, unless it was something where we had to ensure the safety of the public by passing the exam, that kind of thing, it's not desirable because otherwise it just appears punitive. Um, and that is not the goal in any kind of licensure um, discipline. We're not to punish, it's just to ensure public safety. Um, if the conduct is egregious and the licensee perhaps does not wish to fight for their license and, and defend it, um, and they don't wish to accept any conditions, they have the option to surrender. So perhaps if a licensee, um, you know, is perhaps, you know, um, close to retirement or they just feel like it's it's not worth the uh, the fight, the legal fight to attempt to defend their license, they, they do have the option to just surrender it. Um, and if the board is just uh, very concerned about the conduct and that there is no possibility of protecting the public, even with um, probation conditions, um, sometimes revocation is in order. And I have handled um, a case before the, the board that involved revocation because the conduct was just so serious. There was no possibility of, it involved sexual misconduct against several patients and there was just no other option. So revocation was obtained after a hearing. So that is the ultimate um, discipline option. Next slides. Okay. Now, something I've mentioned uh, earlier is uh, a basis for discipline is a substantially related crime. And what is substantially related? Um, this is all, it is defined in the California Code of Regulations 316.5, which is the, the board's uh, um, part of the board's regulations. But there is also case law that describes it, um, and there has to be a ne what they call a nexus between the conduct and practicing. So, obviously, um, if a licensee does something in the course of their practice, uh, such as billing fraud or um, sexual misconduct of, against a patient, that would, of course, be um, very clearly substantially related. Like the nexus is absolutely clear. But sometimes there is conduct that is not in the course of practice that is still substantially related, um, perhaps if there's a financial crime outside of their practice, or if they commit some other crime of perhaps violence uh, against a person outside of their practice, that can also be substantially related as well. So it is defined in, in the regulations, but it's also discussed in case law about what constitutes substantially related. Um, in fact, uh, when I first started the Attorney General's office as part of the multi-step interview process, one of the hypothetical questions they asked me was um, whether I believed that a, a nurse or a would-be nurse um, who had been convicted multiple times of prostitution, if that constituted uh, a substantially related crime. And from what I remember, I believe I argued that it was not substantially related, and I think that was the correct answer. Um, there is, was case law on that topic that prostitution was not substantially related to the practice of nursing. So just because it's a crime doesn't mean it's substantially related. So uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, conviction of crimes and how it works in conjunction with our cases. So it's set forth in the, uh, the board's regulations, 317H, that no contest is basically treated the same as a guilty plea for licensing purposes. So even though they didn't plead 
guilty when they were in criminal court, if they just pled no contest, it doesn't matter. It's all the same in our cases. They can't squeak out of license discipline just because they pled no contest. And that is also set forth in case law, particularly one case called Arneson v. Fox. Unlike criminal cases, an accused licensee can't really take the fifth. I mean, they can take the fifth, but it's not going to avail them the same way it would in criminal courts. So we don't have the same sort of privilege against self-incrimination. I have had a licensee take the fifth in one hearing. It was not a chiropractic case, but the licensee took the fifth because they believed that they could potentially incriminate themselves and they wanted to avoid that. So they took the fifth. However, in our cases, in administrative cases, if a licensee does take the fifth, basically the administrative law judge can really actually use that against them. And their failure to explain the conduct or deny the conduct factors against them and assist the administrative law judge in basically imposing discipline. So a little different from criminal courts. Next slide, please. Okay. Use of alcohol or drugs. So there is case law, and this really comes up, we see it a lot with the healing arts cases. So anytime someone in the health professions is involved in a case or a criminal case involving alcohol or drugs where they're perhaps convicted of DUI, of course that is substantially related and that is a basis for discipline. However, there is case law that says that even if a licensee is not convicted of dangerous behavior while using drugs or alcohol, it can affect practice and can be a basis for discipline. So that is something that could happen. I haven't seen one of those cases before. Typically when we get cases involving drugs or alcohol, it is because the licensee has been convicted of driving under the influence. The only cases I've seen where there's not necessarily conviction is where in teacher cases where, and more often than I would like to see, a teacher arrives at school and is engaged in their duties while under the influence and perhaps alcohol is discovered in their classroom. So we can proceed in that way. But typically for chiropractic board, the cases I've all seen involving alcohol have, as I said, involved a conviction. Next slide, please. Okay. So something I touched on earlier is the unprofessional conduct basis for discipline, which is set forth in the regulations. And as I mentioned, the ones that we see a lot are incompetence, gross negligence, and repeated negligence. Something that's important in these cases, critical in fact, is making sure that we can prove that the licensee's conduct did not meet the standard of care or practice. And basically that is defined legally as the standard of care that a reasonably prudent chiropractor would provide under the same circumstances, same or similar circumstances. So for that reason, the board has a, as I'm sure the board members are familiar with, but for everyone else, the board has a group of experts who are chiropractors who have agreed to assist the board by reviewing cases, specifically investigative reports and documents. And that expert chiropractor is retained to review everything and basically come to a determination as to whether that behavior, the conduct constitutes misconduct. And if so, does it violate the standard of care? And so that expert will then produce a report, basically setting forth all of what they have reviewed, all the documents they have reviewed, the evidence they reviewed, and kind of setting forth the instances of conduct that they think constitutes misconduct, violates the standard of care, and then what cause of discipline that failure to meet the standard of care would be. So whether that's gross negligence, such as an extreme departure from the standard of care. Now, simple negligence is not necessarily grounds for discipline. So if a chiropractor does something that is negligent, but perhaps not extreme, 
um, that would not be a basis for discipline. However, if there are repeated acts of that simple negligence, that could in fact be a basis for discipline. And then finally, this is something we don't see quite as much, but I have I've seen before in cases is incompetence, um, such as they are are not demonstrating that they know the rules to practice the safe practice and they're not demonstrating that they understand the uh, standard of care and not implementing that standard of care. So those, that's another basis for discipline. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So I've thrown a lot of regulations at you. I've gone through a lot of different areas of which um, areas that the AG, AG's office uh, assists the board um, in its mission, but I just kind of wanted to go through a case, a hypothetical case, just so everyone could understand how the discipline process works um, at a practical level with our office. So we'll start off with um, a patient. She makes a complaint um, via the online, perhaps the online uh, complaint um, mechanism. Um, and she makes an online complaint to the board that a chiropractor behaved inappropriately during her treatment session. Um, she is complaining that he touched her buttocks, he stared at her chest for a lengthy period of time and she was very uncomfortable during the appointments. So upon receipt of that complaint, um, the, the board would then open an investigation and they would collect a records release from that patient um, so that they could obtain the medical records from that, the uh, chiropractor at issue. And then basically that would that case would then be um, typically uh, would be referred to DOI. I believe chiropractor, um, the board of chiropractic also has their own investigators. Some some boards use both uh, the division of investigation um, as well as their own internal investigators. Some just purely rely on DOI. And I know that uh, chiropractic does have their own investigators. Um, so the board's investigator would then commence the investigation um, by speaking to the complainant, um, the complaining witness, collecting the medical records, like I mentioned, if there are any other witnesses that um, could be useful in determining if there was misconduct, they'll be interviewed as well. And then once all that uh, information has been collected by the investigator, they will uh, describe all their findings and investigative efforts in investigative reports. Um, that report is then um, reviewed by a supervisor and then it will be transmitted to one of the expert witnesses that I mentioned earlier, um, who is a chiropractor. And that expert witness will then go through the investigative report. If there are any interviews, they'll listen to the interviews. Um, they'll go through all the documents that were collected. Um, a lot of times there's, um, in cases that I've seen, there's maybe perhaps some issues with you know, patient records and billing. They'll go through all of the patient records um, to look for any uh, potential misconduct. And after reviewing everything, they will, as I mentioned, th themselves generate a report that, that uh, sets forth their findings as an expert witness. And that's um, how that works. And then once all of that is complete, the expert has drafted their report uh, based on the uh, investigation and the investigative reports then the board will then process that and transmit it to my office for prosecution. Next slide, please. Um, so this, this kind of just summarizes what I have just described. So it goes from complaint to investigation and production of an expert report. There are situations where an expert report is not needed, but we do need an expert to make any kind of determination as to gross negligence. Um, that's not something that we we can't proceed on a case if you know if there's allegations of gross negligence without that expert. Now, if it's something that's um, very evident that is misconduct, such as you know a conviction um, of a crime, then we don't need an expert to say that that is um, substantially related or you know gross negligence or what have you. Um, the conviction would speak for itself. But anytime that there is any kind of determination to be made, such as gross negligence, incompetence, what have you, an expert is required for that. Uh, when it comes to our office, um, basically it, it, it's a, sent to an office based on lo locality. So if the, 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 crime, the misconduct occurred um, 
in Los Angeles, it would obviously be sent to the Los Angeles office. If it's somewhere close to Los Angeles, such as Bakersfield, it would um, come to our office. And likewise, up north, you know, if it was in uh, you know, a chiropractor in Nevada City, for example, um, it would go to the Sacramento office as the nearest uh, attorney general office. Um, basically, uh, it, the case would be then assigned to a DAG, uh, deputy attorney general, and um, it's kind of just on, you know, basically cases are assigned based on, a, it goes to a certain team under a, a supervisor and then um, based on case numbers essentially is how it is assigned. Although uh, deputies can express a preference, obviously as liaison, I enjoy doing chiropractic cases. Um, I also get a number of other healing arts cases. I think those are the most mm, rewarding and satisfying um, in working on those cases and obtaining justice for patients. Um, in those cases, I do find those incredibly rewarding. Um, I also do a lot of teacher cases for the same reason. Um, if there's, you know, uh, abuse of, of, of a student by a teacher, um, I, I, even though they can be tough to handle, um, sometimes, you know, traumatic for the, the, the student, likewise for patients, um, I, I do feel a real sense of uh, value in, in handling those cases. So, as opposed to, there are certain other boards, not that they're not valuable and important clients, but for example, um, automotive repair cases do not interest me a great deal. So I, I don't hit a lot of those. Um, they're not as, I know I know smog and, and smog regulations are important, but they don't provide the same sense of real satisfaction that, that uh, healing arts cases and chiropractic cases uh, bring me. So I don't do those. Um, but yeah, so the case is then assigned to a DAG and then the DAG will work with um, someone at the, at the enforcement section of the board. So um, whoever is the assigned analyst, the DAG will then communicate with them, providing updates, making sure that if there's any uh, documents that you know the, the deputy has not received. Um, I mean, typically our cases come to us and everything is there that we need to proceed. So uh, we will then draft the accusation. Um, under our guidelines, we do have 90 days to do that. So, I mean, sometimes it's easier, sometimes depending on how uh, voluminous our case log is, um, sometimes it, it can take, you know, as soon as we get it, well, we'd always like to get and draft an accusation as soon as we get it. Sometimes that can't happen based on the, the volume of cases that we have. Um, but we, we try to do it as promptly as possible to make sure that everything is, you know, proceeding smoothly according to our guidelines um, and timelines. So we draft the accusation it goes then back to the board, um, specifically whichever analyst uh, is assigned to our case and they review it for any, you know, make sure there's no typos, make sure everything makes sense, make sure all the information is accurate. It is then reviewed by uh, management within uh, the enforcement section of the, the board. And then if everything is in order, then the executive officer, um, Ms. Walker then signs it and it is filed. Uh, once it's filed, um, we then serve it on the licensee uh, as soon as possible. And then that sort of triggers a whole uh, sequence of events of our handling the case. The licensee then has to file a notice of defense, basically saying that they want to have a hearing or try to settle it. And then it kind of proceeds from there. Um, if the licensee submits a, what's called the notice of defense, which is saying, hey, I want to go to hearing on this case. Um, like, I, you know, they want to have their day in court on, on, the, on the charges. Um, Basically, we would then work with if there's a lot of times there's counsel in cases before the board um, on the other side. So really, um, the more education and uh, skill involved in a profession, the more likely they are to have counsel representing them. So a chiropractor will almost always have representation, legal representation. Um, it's not guaranteed in administrative hearings. You don't it's not like where you get a public defender assigned to you if you're charged in these cases. You have to provide your own attorney, but you can proceed on your own and represent yourself. So in cases such as the Bureau of Automotive Repair or perhaps barbering cases, um, if a barber is accused of misconduct, oftentimes they won't have a lawyer representing them. Um, whereas chiropractors, dentists, veterinarians, they almost always will have uh, legal counsel. So then we will, if once the uh, accusation is filed, served, we get the notice of defense. Um, we'll reach out to counsel. We'll talk about hearing dates, um, schedule a hearing. 
a lot of times, you know, especially with private defense counsel, uh, they're pretty booked up. So it's, you know, oftentimes not going to be an immediate uh, hearing date. It'll be months in the future. And especially with the Office of Administrative Hearings, they get really booked up with all the hearings that we do for all of the different agencies. So it can be sometimes six, seven months in the future. It's the nearest hearing date that we could get. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for the hearing, um, there's a lot of things that the deputies are doing, such as subpoenaing witnesses, um, making sure that everything is in order for, you know, with the, all our evidence is, is ready to go. Um, but we're also trying to settle the case if possible. Um, settlement is, is always preferable if, if possible, because it's just so much more cost effective. Um, so if the if the licensee has committed misconduct that you know warrants an accusation, of course that is serious and not to be taken lightly. However, if it you know if there is indications that the licensee could still practice and safe, safely practice and they are not a danger to the public, then if possible, um, that's something where we try to pursue settlement to avoid the cost, you know, the expense, the effort, uh, the commitment of hearing. Um, which is also uncertain because sometimes our administrative law judges can be very respondent friendly. And even though, you know, we may strongly believe that we have a great case with all the evidence that we need to proceed, I, you know, every, every deputy in my office has had a case where they thought they had it in the bag and the administrative law judge just didn't buy our witnesses, didn't believe our witnesses. And, you know, I, I not often, but uh, I have had losses where, you know, I'm shocked. Um, happened recently in a teacher case where I thought, you know, I was convinced that I had everything I needed to obtain a victory and unfortunately did not. Um, but uh, so that is the reason that we do try to pursue settlement um, rather than going to hearing just to avoid the expense and the uncertainty of outcome where we can ensure that we get the outcome we need to protect the public and to make sure that licensee is doing everything they need to do to comply with the law. So um, we'll work with counsel. Well, I'll be, you know, the DAG will also be talking to uh, the analysts of the board who will be in consultation with their managers um, and seeing if there's a settlement that can be reached that, you know, oftentimes that's three or five years of probation and what terms are most appropriate to protect the public and to ensure that licensee is really doing and complying with the law and regulations as, as required. So, um, you know, best case scenario, we have reached a settlement. Um, everyone's in agreement. The board is okay with it. They've reviewed and approved, uh, the enforcement has reviewed and approved the stipulation. It's been signed. Um, the deputy then prepares a recommendation to adopt, uh, kind of outlining why they think the settlement should be approved. That is um, prepared and given to uh, the analyst who then transmits it to uh, the members of the board. And then you, the members of the board, then review um, the circumstances of that settlement and decide whether to adopt or reject it. Um, that, that, that's basically what happens. If the case proceeds to hearing and a settlement could not be reached um, for whatever reason, then basically the administrative law judge uh, takes everything under submission. They then have 30 days to draft their decision. Um, so it's not the same gratification as in criminal court where you have the jury reaching a verdict right then and there. Unfortunately, we have to wait. Uh, usually the full 30 days, um, the administrative law judge drafts the decision, sends it off to the board. I don't even see it, or the deputy does not even see it um, until much later in the game. And then when the proposed decision reaches you, the members of the board, um, you then do the same thing. You review it and decide whether you want to adopt it, modify it, or reject it. Um, after that point, then the deputy finds out the outcome of the case and whether they were successful or not at the hearing. So um, that's how I would say the majority of all accusation cases proceed. Uh, in rare circumstances, we do have a, you know situations where a licensee is, um, you know, they lose at hearing, they're angry at the outcome, and they believe it's not justified, and so they will take uh, decision, final decisions of the board up on writs. Uh, thankfully, it doesn't happen too often. Although I have several writs I'm dealing with right now for other agencies. Um, including the Board of Registered Nursing, Teacher Credentialing, and uh, the Funeral Bureau. So those cases are basically kind of like a mini appeal where the Superior Court judge reviews everything, like the transcripts from the admin hearing, um, 
all the pleadings, all of that, and they decide if, if the board's decision was uh, an abuse of discretion or not. Um, more often than not, in fact, most of the time, uh, the judge will not interfere with the board's decision. There's a great deal of uh, deference that superior court judges will give uh, the board's decision in these cases. Um, and so typically if a case goes up on writ, uh, we are successful in defending it and the board's decision is upheld. Um, in very infrequent cases, uh, a licensee will be so angry that they not only take it up on writ, um, they will lose on writ, and then they will proceed to the next step, which is taking it up on appeal. Um, again, often not times successful, but it does happen in rare circumstances. And next slide, please. Okay, um, I have already talked about quite a bit of this. Um, there's just a couple things I wanted to mention. Sorry, I'm taking longer than I expected. Okay, um, as I mentioned, majority of cases do settle, uh, which is um, the preferred outcome if possible. Again, sometimes it's not uh, because the, the misconduct is just too egregious or we can't reach a meeting of minds. But um, something I did want to mention about um, when we we do settlements, uh, there's a thing called uh, well the admissions part of the settlement. And there's the default is always what we call hard admissions or full admissions. And that's basically where the licensee admits to the conduct as alleged in the accusation. Um, so that's the default. But there is something that we can use. It's a little tool in negotiating what we call soft admissions. Um, legally speaking, it has, for, for the board's purposes, it has the same impact as hard admissions. Um, and soft admissions are basically, that's a few paragraphs that essentially state that the licensee acknowledges that if the matter proceeded to hearing, the board could, uh, you know, prove up the allegations. Uh, but to avoid the expense and uncertainty of hearing, they will uh, admit that there is there could be a factual basis and they agree to accept the discipline of the board. So those are soft admissions. It's kind of like a no contest plea in administrative land um, versus a guilty plea. But again, legally speaking, they have the same impact as hard admissions. Um, the only reason that they're, I think, useful for, for deputies in my office is because we can uh, kind of use them as a negotiating tool like, oh, you, you know, it's not a hard admissions, you're getting soft admissions, so it's not uh, as serious. So if they're perhaps being sued in, in civil court for the same conduct, um, you know, it, it's not a direct admission that can be used against them in a civil um, civil proceeding. It just kind of also makes them feel better that they're not directly admitting to everything as charged. But again, legally speaking, has the same outcome as far as the board. Anything that they is alleged in that accusation can be used as prior discipline in a future case if, uh, you know, hopefully they don't ever commit future misconduct, but if they do, we can use that that conduct in the in the accusation despite the soft admissions, no matter what. So, next slide, please. Okay. Um, again, um, I've talked about the role of the administrative law judge. Um, so on the judiciary side of things, we have the ALJ who is basically hearing the case on behalf of the board and making their proposed decision. But again, it's just proposed. Ultimately, the board has the final say. Um, also on the judiciary side is DCA counsel and Sabina Knight is, I believe, your uh, DCA counsel. And I've spoken to her over email and she, she seems great. Um, and then also on the judiciary, we have the superior court judges that handle writs. Um, so typically in Los Angeles, there's a handful of judges that handle administrative writs, they know what they're doing very well. And um, I'm sure it is the same for the other offices in Sacramento. There's probably a handful of writ judges that handle uh, admin cases arising out of license discipline. Now, on the other side are the litigants. We have Ms. Walker, the executive officer, um, who is the complainant. Um, we have our office, who basically is just the prosecutors on behalf of the executive officer. We have respondent who is seeking to overturn the discipline or, you know, avoid discipline. Um, and then we have counsel, which is most often, more often than not, uh, representing the respondent in these cases. So next slide, please. Okay. Um, just as in civil court, um, you know, our ALJs, they are judges for our purposes. Um, they basically, they don't do any investigation. They, they're they not having ex parte communications. Um, 
communications outside of the hearing with any of the litigants. Um, so, you know, we're not having, you know, private conversations with the aid administrative law judges about how we think the respondent really committed all that misconduct or anything that would be highly inappropriate. We just, um, all communications are shared with, um, the opposing party. So if there's something we need to file, um, with OAH, the Office of Administrative Hearings, we always serve a copy on respondents and res or respondents council to make sure that there are no ex parte com communications. Um, that's kind of to ensure due process in this whole proceeding to make sure it's fair and equitable. Um, something else I wanted to mention is that, um, you know, our, our deputies obviously don't communicate with the board directly. That would be inappropriate. We are allowed to produce the recommendation memo after a settlement is reached, and that's something that is permissible. Um, but we are not allowed to obviously, um, you know, contact any of you via email or phone or anything like that to discuss a case. That would be, again, a violation. And so we don't do any of that. Um, so there have been situations where I have been asked to present uh, options to, for example, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing when a case is, when they're deciding whether to take a case up on appeal, but that is uh, a limited presentation in a public forum where, you know, I present options um, to the commission or I guess to a board about next future legal steps. But that is something that is very infrequent. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. And something else I wanted to touch on. Um, so the difference between the DAG and DCA staff council. Um, so, you know, deputies in my office don't have a lot of uh, contact with DCA council. Um, DCA council kind of function as almost in-house council for each each board. Um, I believe each agency has one DC uh, one attorney assigned to them, but there may be agencies because of the volume of cases or just uh, they may have perhaps more than one, but I, I believe it is just one for most most uh, licensing agencies. Um, as in-house counsel, effectively, they kind of are the personal advisor to the board, um, providing legal guidance, as I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, on meetings, decisions, um, and if it's kind of internal legal documents for the board to use, that's all handled by DCA counsel uh, versus my office. The AG's office, again, is just the prosecutor. Um, we're not involved in internal dealings of the board. We, we just handle cases that are transmitted to us, um, whether it's you know in, um, at OAH or if a case goes up on writ or appeal, that's, that's you know, the sole... Uh, focus of our job is just to prosecute cases on behalf of the board. Uh, next slide, please. And that is the end of my presentation. So if any of you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I know that was a lot. Sorry. Well, I'll, um, I'll go first. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Ms. Miller. That, um, that was very detailed and very thorough, and, and I think it answered a lot of questions. Um, so I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm I'm wondering uh, do, briefly: are these slides are available for all the board members and attendees? So are these part of the packet? I, I guess that's a question for staff. Really, I, well, I, I'm I assuming they're available I'm, on your end. Yes, if if the board um, staff is willing to share them, uh, that's fine by me, of course. Okay, I, I would hope maybe we could include them with the packet. I. Um, I think they'd be nice to have as a reference uh, material. So appreciate you sharing those. Um, I think, you know, I would I would remind all the uh, attendees and licensees that you, uh, from the just what you mentioned earlier, you know, um, the Section three fourteen of our regulations does, you know, is you know designates a duty to report. And so uh, thank you for mentioning that. Um, and uh, I just want to remind all of our licensees that we there is a duty to report. Um, and I'm I'm wondering if uh, we we've kind of moved to a while ago. We we took on the concept that um, you know the the suspensions were punitive, and that you know we should consider those really only in in cases of where there, we thought it was in the interest of public safety. And uh, so thank you for bringing that up too. I think it's something we've moved to and it's nice to hear the support from, um, you know, the attorney general side of uh, 
the attorney general's office side of that issue. Um, I, I have one comment question. You know, we had a case recently in the soft admissions. It's really difficult. Part of our job is when we interview petitioners is to really get a sense of their rehabilitation. And it, it seems really difficult, at least from my view, to have somebody who um, has only had soft admissions and then show up for an interview and deny essentially that there was anything wrong or that one of the charges actually occurred, et cetera. And, uh, and, and it makes it really hard to, to then, you know, uh, reduce, um, you know, to do anything with it when they're sitting there, um, you know, because they only had soft admissions. And so we can't really rely on the fact that they, you know, there was a hard admission and, uh, you know, they want it, they're asking for a probation reduction and, um, it just makes it really difficult on, on our side. And so I'm, I'm wondering on your end, uh, like, is there some guidance for us there? I mean, I know you said they're equivalent for us into the future, maybe from the letter of the law and the, that perspective, but any guidance for us on, on how to accept that situation? That, that, that is very interesting. I hadn't um, heard that uh, occurring with any of our boards before, and I'm actually a little surprised that the, uh, the the licensee would then try to claim that they, you know, didn't commit the uh, the allegations. It, like I said, it is from our office's perspective, it is deemed an admission. And when we present our recommendations to adopt, something that we always include in there is that you know the licensee admits the charges because soft admissions are still an admission. Um, it's perhaps not as strongly worded, but it is still an admission. So for licensees to then, you know, if petitioning for modification or what have you, or early termination to then claim that they didn't do the charges uh, is very disingenuous on our part. And I mean, I, my job is again, not to ad advise the board on, on your, your functions outside of, um, outside of, you know, our admin proceedings when they're assigned to us. But I mean, that would cause me concern. Um, you know, in a hypothetical situation, if I was a member of the board where a licensee was then denying the conduct, that would strike me as disingenuous and dishonest, um, and perhaps demonstrating an in incomplete understanding of what those admissions are, which should be explained by their, their counsel um, when they enter into that settlement agreement. So um, I will discuss with my, my supervisors, because I've never heard of that particular situation before, and ask if there's any further guidance that I can present to uh, board uh, management that they can, you know, have for, for reference as well. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for the presentation. Let me open up for any uh, questions or comments from the full board. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Hi, Miss Miller. I had a, a question when you were talking about uh, Penal Code Twenty Three. It reminded me, it probably doesn't apply, but I just wanted a little bit more information. It reminded me of uh, a woman complained of sexual misconduct conduct with a licensee. Um, somebody else did. And during the licensee being investigated, there was another occurrence with somebody else. And it was brought up as, you know, why isn't this licensee, um, while they're being investigated, uh, why why are they still practicing? Well, you know, a couple things come to mind. You know, it has they haven't been proven guilty, right? It's being investigated. But the Penal Code 23, and then I don't know if maybe it was the ISO or 494, um, kind of made me think of that case. Is there anything to do um, in such cases where there's been allegations of sexual misconduct um, is there anything that the board can do during the investigation to uh, prevent that from happening to other people? Um, so I didn't know if you had any comments on that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Penal Code 23 is um, would be the best and preferred option in these circumstances where there is an initial allegation and, and charges filed. I mean, um, under criminal procedure, uh, if a person is arrested and charged, um, they have to be arraigned in short order. Um, and then a preliminary hearing is supposed to follow on a pretty close timeline thereafter arraignment. Um, they do have the option to waive, uh, or not waive, excuse me, um, 
delay the preliminary hearing because of evidence gathering. And, you know, if the conduct is severe enough that, you know, the judge is convinced that there is a danger to the real danger to the public, you know, imminent danger, they will sometimes, you know, the person will be arrested and in custody, which obviously will prevent future harm. But if they are out on own recognizance or they have posted, you know, they have posted bail, basically, you know, at that time, we do have to wait for the preliminary hearing to appear. I mean, we can try to go in. Sometimes that is an option for the board. And that's something, you know, if there's a case where sometimes preliminary hearings get kind of pushed and pushed and they rescheduled just because that's how the criminal justice system is sometimes not as rapid as you would wish. In those circumstances, I can mention to the analyst I'm working with at the board and say, look, you know, I have the option of trying to go in earlier, maybe either at arraignment or when there is a trial setting conference before the preliminary hearing. There is a risk that I can go in and the judge will say, absolutely not. This is moot, you know, or it's untimely because there's no evidence yet. But for all of those situations where that happens, sometimes the deputy can be successful in convincing the judge to issue a restriction before the prelim. The downside of that, you know, is the cost of the deputy. You know, criminal proceedings are pretty much all in person now. So, you know, it's the deputy going in, appearing, and it may be for nothing because the judge could still deny us. Because the only time we're really, really confident in our ability to get that restriction is when there is evidence, which is required by the case law at the prelim. But, you know, if we're worried about the timeline and the licensee is still practicing, in that situation, it might be appropriate for the deputy to appear at the next trial setting conference and say, Your Honor, you know, we're here at the trial setting conference because we need public protection now. We need a restriction now. And like I said, some judges will grant a restriction at that time to ensure public protection. I have seen it. I've obtained it in a barber case involving sexual assault of a client. It was prior to the prelim. So we are occasionally successful in that route. So it is an option, but there's just the risk that we may not be successful and that is more expense for the board. In situations where there's definitely a criminal case that's ongoing, the law enforcement, whether it's the sheriffs or LAPD or Sacramento PD or whatever police department is investigating, those are situations where we probably don't want to go the route of doing a full-blown accusation because we would have to use all those same witnesses for the crime that were, you know, the victim of the crime and any other witnesses. We would have to use those in our hearing to prove up our case. And if you're having people testify, law enforcement would get very angry and we would potentially jeopardize the criminal case. So those are perhaps not the best option doing the 494. But if the person is out on bail or what have you, and they have also demonstrated, you know, I don't know, mental instability or some sort of mental illness, then we could perhaps, that's something that, you know, board management wouldn't want to talk about with the deputies and perhaps supervisors at the AG's office, whether we can do perhaps basically an 820 petition for, you know, mental instability. Okay, so that actually leads to my next question on the code 820 CCR 315. What are the requirements or level of evidence to compel an exam? Again, just thinking of somebody who maybe is, that threatens sort of their reputation, et cetera, that what are we using as the evidence to compel an exam by a licensee? And then who are the people that we are using to, you know, who's in our group of diagnosing mental health and or dementia or Alzheimer's? Because those are very extensive exams in my world to be able to accurately say that. So I didn't know if you had information on that. I can answer part of your question. So basically, it's any conduct that really indicates that the person is, I mean, if they're being, for example, I had a dentist case where the dentist was being very aggressive and saying inappropriate things to patients. And he had basically a practice for children. He was very aggressive and just saying really odd things to his minor patients. In that situation, that was enough to justify the board 
issuing an, an 820, um, basically buying an 820, and then he had to go get a mental evaluation because of that. Um, it can be, there was, I had a nursing case that involved um, a, a nurse who was making threats against coworkers. Like he, he didn't actually commit any acts of violence, but he was making aggressive, threatening, very threatening comments uh, about committing extreme violence on his coworkers. Um, that was the basis of another 820. Um, one I did for the chiropractic board involved a, a chiropractor who, well, he, he was basically charged with touching people inappropriately, uh, a, a employee of a bank, um, and she filed a police report, but ultimately the city attorney's office did not pursue uh, a criminal case against him for that. So we just had the arrest report. So that was something that could have been up. Uh, the basis, you know, for actually that was, pardon me, that I misspoke. That was an ISO. But um, if someone does something that's really questionable, I mean, it can't be just, it'd have to be concerning enough where, you know, um, it really calls into question their mental fitness to practice. And that could be enough to say for the board to say, look, we're really worried. You need to go get a, an examination. I don't exactly know who the list is or how the board that's something that I haven't dealt with for any agency, um, how they come up with a list of acceptable examiners, but it's someone obviously who is accredited, skilled in that area of mental examination for whatever aspect it is um, okay. to make sure it's the appropriate examination. Thank you. And just to echo Dr. Paris, the case was very bizarre and the person sat there and basically denied, it was a soft, uh, uh, Forget what word. Anyways, denied everything, and we were just sort of left. Uh, it was quite a kerfuffle. So um, we we were very confused as to how to handle it and move forward. So, but thank you for your time. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Are there any uh, further questions, discussion from the board members? Just thank you for your time and for your presentation and uh, for clarifying some of those issues around the soft and hard admissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Miller, I'm gonna open this up. Uh, uh, I'm gonna ask the moderator to open this up for public comment. And we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone has any comment on the presentation, you can look for the question mark icon in the lower right corner of your WebEx screen or behind the three dot other options if you're on a mobile device and type the word comment in that text box and click send or anyone may raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon and our call in users can press star three to raise their hands. Each person will have three minutes to speak. And as an informational item, uh, board member Raphael Sweet is currently in the meeting. I see no requests for public comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And thank you for noting uh, Mr. Sweet's attendance here. Morning, my apologies for being late. No problem, no problem at all. Well, thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, and I hope we can have you back into the future. Um, seems like we always have some questions uh, around this, and um, so th that was really helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Take care. Bye. Okay, so um, we will have a break coming up just to let everyone know. So, But first, before we do that, um, uh, let's move back out of order to uh, agenda item number eight, which was an update um, uh, from the DCA, from the Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Board and Bureau Relations. Unfortunately, Ms. Bucciarelli uh, was still having technical issues, um, but she did submit a, a written report, and uh, I'm going to ask Ms. Walker if she can present that for us. Sure, thank you. Um, so the first, so this uh, delivering this report on behalf of um, the department's Office of Board and Bureau Relations. Um, first, they were sharing an update with the board about new DCA staff. 
They're very excited to announce that the governor appointed leaders to DCA's Board and Bureau Relations team this fall. Melissa Gear um, is serving as DCA's new deputy director, and Yvonne Durantes is serving as the new assistant deputy director. Uh, the department is also pleased to announce the appointment of Kathleen Nichols as chief of the Division of Investigation. She was sworn in on December 5th. Ms. Nichols has extensive law enforcement experience with over 26 years of investigating and supervisory experience. The department has begun the process to fill the deputy chief position in the health quality investigation unit. As far as DCA's um, diversity, equity, and inclusion steering committee, the department had established its first diversity, equity, and inclusion steering committee um, to guide the department's equity strategy, initiatives, and action plans. The, that committee um, held its official kickoff meeting on November 9th, and its second meeting will be held later this month. Additional resources will be forthcoming that the boards will be able to use and incorporate into their strategic plans and recruitment processes. The committee is concentrating on three key areas. First, workforce, find and keep diverse talent. Um, second, workplace, actively educate leaders and employees to raise awareness and foster an inclusive culture. And third, marketplace, be sensitive to the diverse backgrounds and perspectives of consumers, applicants, and licensees. Um, DCA also has an update on strategic planning. So to more effectively advance equity and drive outcomes that increase opportunity for all, strategic plans for July 2023 and beyond must be developed or updated in accordance with Governor Newsom's executive order. DCA is revising its strategic planning processes to include more inclusive public engagement, data analysis, and the incorporation of diversity, equity, and inclusion into strategic planning. Um, the committee that I had discussed will provide input on the strategic planning processes in the coming months, and then DCA will begin implementing the revised processes and working with boards on updating existing strategic plans or developing new ones by March of 2023. Um, DCA also um, is excited they released the, um, their new strategic plan in November and officially transitioned to a new logo on January 3rd of 2023. That new logo will be implemented gradually throughout the year. Um, existing items with the previous DCA logo are still valid during this transition and they do not need to be replaced or updated. Um, DCA board and bureau re leadership have been given information and resources to help with the new logo's implementation and a centralized website is also available at dca.ca.gov slash logo. Uh, the new plan and logo represent the department's next chapter and future with consumer protection continuing to guide the mission and priorities. Um, DCA holds itself to a high standard as a licensing entity, regulator, educator, and service provider. And additionally, that the plan incorporates DCA's strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as their shared commitment to each and every consumer. The new logo not only displays our state's official colors, but it also visually represents the DCA's vision, which is together protecting California consumers. The shield symbolizes DCA's strong and longstanding protection mandate. Um, the state symbolizes all 40 million Californians DCA has pledged and is honored to serve. And the star symbolizes consumer protection as DCA's true guiding principle, its own North Star. If you have any questions about the logo, please contact Melissa Gear, Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Relations. The next update is on board member travel. <clears throat> so as travel resumes, keep in mind that all state travel arrangements must be made through DCA's authorized travel agency, Cal Travel Store or Concur. When traveling by air on official state business, all board members and staff must use the most economical fares possible. Typically, this is the Southwest want to get away option. However, if the flight is changed, there may be additional charges. Flight changes for personal convenience are not permitted or justified, and the traveler is responsible for any associated charges. Um, please contact Board and Bureau Relations um, or board staff if there's any travel questions. Um, and a reminder on the required member trainings. Um, so now is the time to go over all necessary board member trainings and submit your certificates of completion to um, to me, your executive officer, and to DCA at memberrelations at dca.ca.gov. Board members must complete board member orientation, commonly referred to as BMOT, within the first year of appointment or reappointment. 
ethics training within six months of appointment and every two years thereafter, sexual harassment prevention training within the first year and every two years thereafter, and defensive driver, defensive driver training within the first year and every four years. For your convenience, these trainings are offered multiple times a year in a variety of formats. For more information, a mandatory trainings page has been created to help members identify, access, and track specified trainings. The page includes direct links to mandatory trainings as well as pertinent information and policies specific to these training courses. The page is available via the DCA Board, and Bureau, board Member Resource Center page under Required Board Member Training. You can also reach out to Melissa or Yvonne and board staff will share this information with you as well. Looking ahead, um, DCA is inviting presidents and vice presidents to their president's training on February 23rd, 2023 from 10 a.m. to noon. This virtual two-hour training will outline the role of a board president, including understanding the scope of the role, managing board members, and performing administrative duties. More information will be available soon and I will share it with you. Um, end of the COVID-19 state of emergency and waivers, um, February 28th of 2023. The state of emergency and associated executive orders um, will end on February 28th of 2023. Upon the state of emergency ending, active waivers that were issued under the authority of the state of emergency and executive orders will also expire. And um, the department thanks you for your dedicated service throughout the pandemic. Another reminder is to file your annual Form 700s by March 15th of 2023. Uh, board and committee members are required to file a Statement of Economic Interests Form 700 within 30 days of their appointment annually and within 30 days of leaving office. This year's annual filing period covers the prior calendar year, 2022, and the deadline for filing is Friday, April 1st, 2023. But to ensure compliance, DCA is requesting that Form 700 filers complete the e-filing by Friday, March 15th, 2023. You should have recently received an email from NetFile with instructions on how to file your annual Form 700. If you have any questions or would like more information, please contact Melissa Gear, or you can also reach out to me directly. Um, so BMOT is going to be held on March 22nd, 2023. Um, board members must complete BMOT within the first year of their appointment or reappointment. Um, on March 22nd, BMOT will be offered as a live virtual day of training and possibly in person on June 20th, 23 and October 10th of 2023. More information will be available soon and members can sign up using DCA's learning management system. Um, and with that, that concludes DCA's update um, and the DCA and Board and Bureau Relations team look forward to working with and assisting you throughout this new year. Great. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Walker, and um, thank you to the DCA for uh, presenting us with an update. Maybe we maybe we look at a new logo. <laughs> um, okay, so let me open this up. Are there um, any questions or discussion from the board members? Hearing none, moderator, can we please open this agenda item for public comment? Certainly, we've opened up the WebEx Q&A feature to facilitate public comment. If anyone has a comment on the DCA updates, you can look for the question mark icon, type the word comment into that text box and click send, or anyone may raise their hand by clicking on the hand icon and in our call-in users can press star three to raise their hand. Each speaker will have three minutes. And I do not see any requests for comment. Shall I close the public comment feature? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, so next, uh, if we can move to agenda item number 11, and before we start that, um, I think we're going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, I have it as 11-11, uh, and so we'll come back at, uh, let's go 11-22, and we'll return it to agenda item number 11. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> 